Refugees are individuals who have a well-founded fear of returning to their country of homeland for reasons of persecution. Could be religious based, could be politically based, could be they belong to the wrong ethnic minority, if you will, and so they've had to flee. A refugee is already outside of their own country in a second country, and in the second country they are vetted for the possibility of refugee status. There's an intense scrutinization that goes on and only a very small percentage of those who apply are eligible for refugee status. And of those, even a smaller percentage are slated to come to the United States. There are three major players in refugee resettlement. The first being Homeland Security. That is the federal agency that's responsible for the vetting process. When refugees then are indeed slated for the United States, we introduce the second player, which is the State Department. And the State Department arranges for the transport of those individuals to come to the United States. And they also, at that time, enter into agreements with national resettlement agencies, and they come together and discuss the deployment of those folks when they come to the United States. Wherever they are in the world, um, they'll have a health screening done. It usually, um, or oftentimes, it's done at embassies um, or in refugee camps, if there's a processing center in the refugee camp. And that information is actually given to the refugee, and it's collected at the port of entry. We have always worked very closely with the Henrico Health Department, which has done an outstanding job. Refugees receive an overseas health screening as well as orientation, but when they come to the United States, they also have to have a health screening and receive orientation here. So that's one of the things that the health department does and does very well. We have an office support specialist who receives a phone call from one of our three resettlement agencies in the area and they request an appointment for a family. Uh, we don't, at that point, have names or ages. Uh, we just know that we have a family of five arriving from Afghanistan or a family of two from Nepal or something like that. We get notifications from the electronic disease notification system as to who's coming. We print off overseas medical paperwork. The resettlement agencies also fax over information, but other than what's on their overseas medical paperwork, we don't know anything else prior to them walking through the door. Within the first 90 days, we have to see them, and we do a health screen, mainly to make sure that they don't have any uh, communicable diseases, and if they do, we, we treat them so that they don't spread those to other people. One, two, three. We also give them vaccinations, and then we refer them to community providers for other medical services. Right away, we have to make them pee in a cup, and then draw their blood, so it's very, we get to know them very intimately, <laughs> pretty quickly. Once you've tried to explain a urine sample with charades and no words, it kind of breaks the ice a little bit, which we have to do with everyone, because when we do that, we don't have an interpreter, and that's one of the first things we have to do. We are gonna talk about some of the vaccinations they need today, if you can introduce yourself and let them know. We use an interpreter service uh, on a speakerphone, so we always speak to them in their native language. Polio is a disease that can cause paralysis and other health problems, so she needs one more polio shot. We encourage it, even if they speak some English, because it does, I think, build more rapport to not have them kind of stumble through medical questions in a language that's not their native. So I think that we build that trust, but I, there's definitely, I think when they get there, they're kind of like, what is this all about? It seems that some of them have the perception that if we find something wrong with them, that they maybe would be sent back, which is not the case. You know, I think a lot of them have been mistreated by their own governments, which is how they ended up becoming refugees in the first place. They don't have a lot of trust for a government healthcare provider. So it's definitely, the first visit, there's, you do have to build some rapport and some trust. What we do to kind of head that off is say, we'll start out the conversation with saying, I need to ask you a lot of health questions. And if you have problems, that's okay. We're asking so that we can connect you with the right services. If this has no effect of your, on your status and being in the U.S. Many refugees have, a, they don't necessarily have a high level of health literacy. I mean, a lot of people in general don't. So explaining things takes time. Does she have any medical problems? It's not something that people always easily understand, so I'm not sure how many hours we devote to refugees, but it's a lot. They bake uh, five to six minutes. And after five, six minutes, you see how they look bread. I hope you like.
I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm from uh, city Srebrenica. There was a uh, war, and uh, when they occupied Srebrenica, I walk uh, through hills and forest 33 days without food, drink, anything. We eat just uh, leaves, grass, mushrooms, whatever you find in the forest. I got injured in my foot. Another friend, he got shot in um, Abel. And um, my uh, cousin, he got shot and he died over there. I uh, go to Freedom Lane. They call it Kladan. Two months I stay in the hospital. I say, let's start a new life. I apply for uh, United States, in Canada, in Embassy, Australia, and uh, whatever who first uh, approved, you know, and they're first coming from here. When we get here, this is not good. You know, like, I don't understand nothing. That's all different life from Europe, our life, you know. I don't understand none. No speak English. Only I know, thank you, that's it. A refugee office uh, pay for us tickets. And uh, after we get a uh, job, and we pay every month a little bit, you know, to pay off the ticket. Each refugee comes not for free to the U.S. They each have a travel loan. Um, that they have to start paying back within six months of being in the country. Um, that typically runs from about 700 to um, estimating probably about $1,200 a person. So it doesn't seem that bad for one person, but when you have a family of five and you start off working a minimum wage job, that can be pretty big to your budget. I work uh, over 10 years, two jobs. No day off, no after four off. I work two jobs to try uh, open something and do something uh, different, you know, because I love this. We have uh, all traditional uh, Bosnian food. I try to bring here something uh, different. All food, whatever we have, we make in morning. We start at 4, 5 o'clock in the morning to, to all day run. If we run something out for lunch, for dinner, we start cook again. A lot of people like, and uh, every day we have more and more customers. When they open, i show you later on, they're inside empty. You can uh, fill uh, with anything, bara or uh, meat or uh, anything, whatever you like, uh, make sandwich, burger, and anything. When refugees arrive to the United States, they are greeted at the airport by a refugee resettlement agency. And that resettlement agency assists them with adjusting to life in the United States and helping them navigate those systems. Usually we get a two weeks note for uh, that family is coming. Once we get this one, what we do is we start talking to if they have a U.S. tie in here. We also talk to the U.S. tie to try and find out what's the best way of finding them an accommodation, housing and all this kind of thing. We have to visit every single guy who comes here on, on the next day, 24 hour visit. We must conduct a home visit to check the family. How are they? Is there any concerns? And then thereafter, we started helping them through everything. We take them to appointments. We also do them some intake about the jobs, how the jobs work in this country. Uh, and, and also about the U.S. law. We also tell them a little bit about the U.S. laws, especially things like marriage and children and cultural things that they really lack. I come from Darfur, which is that far region of the Sudan. Um, very volatile over the past few years uh, with lots of people in the IDP camps. When I came here, that was still striking in my mind that I really need to, to do uh, anything that will be uh, humanitarian help related and luckily I got this job here so uh, I think I, I find myself here and, and I'm really really um, pleased that I'm, I'm in a position to help. It is tough, it is difficult. The biggest issue here is a language because most of them come here and they don't speak any language. Is brother good? Timmy is Sally's brother, is that right? The Henrika County Adult Education Center offers English for speakers of other languages. Encompassed in every class is listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, so it's, a, it's not a focus of just um, writing, but you'll have all of the aspects of learning the English language within the class. The students are learning how to navigate life in the United States and, and all of our teachers are here in Henrico and, and how in particular navigate life in Henrico County. Can you say childs? 
No, you have to say children. It's very much a community atmosphere. They get to come and see their friends or meet new people who, who may or may not be from their home country. Um, and when doing that, uh, they become attached to us and want to continue to come. And that's the best feedback for us is that they want to come back year after year after year. And they love the welcoming atmosphere. They love meeting other students who are in similar situations to them who are new to our country and they feel comfortable here. Bill and John, Jen are married. So when adults come to our program, it's a little bit more difficult because they have age on them and it takes a longer time to learn English. Um, the younger you are in learning a language, the easier it is for you to learn. There's always the battle of practicing your English and the students that um, have an opportunity to speak English on a daily basis tend to do better than the students who go home and speak their native language and never practice their English. We have a lot of families who have children in the Himriko school system and can you know, piggyback on what they're learning. The first point of contact for any child who registers in a public school system is their home school. There they complete a home language survey and if they select a language other than English that has impacted them or that's spoken in the home, they're referred to our Welcome Center. The goal is to provide a comfortable, quiet place for non-English speaking students and their families to register for school. So when they come here, we provide the registration support, give them information about the public school system, about school lunches, and adult ESL. Are there any other languages that he speaks or understands? Sometimes they bring an interpreter, sometimes we provide an interpreter, but they're generally accompanied by a school liaison. When a student comes to our Welcome Center, they take an English language proficiency assessment. And based on that proficiency level, that helps guide how much ESL instruction they're going to have. You're going to look at these right here. I'm going to read to you and you're going to choose one of those. Anywhere from a level one, which would be a beginning student, to a level five, and we even have some students who don't need English language services. So those results are very important in order for the students to get the support they need. We also evaluate transcripts, which can be very challenging because you're looking at a transcript from Somalia or from Afghanistan, and the school system is very different there. So it's important that our staff receive training on how to, how to equitably and fairly evaluate a transcript so that a student gets the credits they need to earn in order to graduate from high school. What we find with many of the students that register in Henrico County Schools that are refugees is their educational background is, is varied, but surprisingly many of the students are extremely well educated and their biggest barriers are cultural, assimilating into the public school system, and then learning the English language. A personal misconception that I had before I started this program is that all refugees are kind of coming from villages in developing countries. I didn't really think about how diverse refugees can be. So even if you were a wealthy, educated doctor in your country, if you are being persecuted, you may have to go live in a refugee camp as well. Some people have been in camps for a decade or longer. You know, camp sounds temporary, but some of these refugee camps are really are not temporary places. They're, people are born and die there. Virginia has a very diverse um, refugee program in terms of geography. We resettle in Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Newport News, Charlottesville, Harrisonburg, and Roanoke. Numbers wise, in Metro Richmond, anywhere from two to three hundred in a given year and that's of about two thousand to twenty five hundred that we resettle throughout the state. If you can imagine you know having to leave your country today and within 90 days setting up your family with minimal assistance, minimal transportation assistance, minimal financial assistance and doing it all within about 90 days and it's remarkable what they accomplish in this in that short time frame but they do. Somebody who has come through that hard and lots of atrocities. I would believe that when he comes to this place, at least he's safe, he's secure, he has got some way of working, he has got some income. I'm one of them. I'm 100% happy because I'm safe now. And I think this applies to all other refugees. After 10 years, say, okay, let now take uh, citizenship. And now I'm citizen here. All my family is citizen here. 
Hraiko is a really nice place for me for right now. I love this. I have many patients who can't read or write in their own language and um, if we're in clinic and I see that that person makes an X and doesn't sign their name, I kind of do a timeout and say, hold on, let's write your name. And I take their hand and I take the pen and we write their name and I can't really take credit for that. That's something that my predecessor, Jill Grumbine, um, she did that and I saw her do that before I was a nurse. I would write the individual's name on a piece of paper and show them and through an interpreter explain, this is how you write your name in English. And I would say, take this paper home and, and practice. And I'll never forget this one lady. She came back on Thursday afternoon and that paper, piece of paper was filled front and back with her name written out so many times and she was so proud of that. Okay, I'm going to hand that out. Success is, you know, acclimating to American life, which refugees really, I think, do a great job of. In order to kind of go through the process of fleeing your country and living in a camp and applying to come to the United States, you have to be a strong person. You have to really have a drive to make a change in your life. We are a nation founded on immigrants and refugees, and so I think it's um, just who we are as a country that we continue this program and they become active contributing members of society.